FTL, faster-than-light speed, is a term that refers to the movement of matter faster than the speed of light under vacuum condition. According to the principles of the special theory of relativity, a particle that has rest mass and moves at a speed slower than the speed of light requires infinite energy to accelerate it to light speed. Although the special theory of relativity does not mathematically rule out the existence of theoretical subatomic particles that always move faster than light, known as tachyons, in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, FTL travel is the primary method of interstellar movement over long distances in the galaxy. Various forms of this advanced technology allow its users to cover the vast distances of interstellar space in a short period of time, whereas non-FTL engines would need decades or centuries for the same journey. In this issue, we learn about the most utilized FTL travel methods by the factions of the distant and grim future world. Let's start with the Necrons. They are the keepers of the most ancient and amazing technologies in the Warhammer world. Their mode of transportation is no less interesting. Dolmen gates are essentially a living stone portal that serves as gates into a part of the webway created by the Old Ones. The Dolmen gate technology was first developed by the Necrons with the help of the Catan known as Nyadrazatha the Burning. With this technology, the Necrons were able to gain a significant advantage during the War in Heaven and could move quickly in interstellar space without relying on sublight stasis ships with antimatter engines. Dolmen gates now represent the only means by which the Necrons can travel interstellar distances at FTL speeds, as this faction does not have psychers. By the end of the 41st millennium, most of the Dolmen gates, still scattered across the galaxy, were destroyed by the Eldar, or had fallen into disrepair over time. The few that still function have allowed some Necron dynasties to rapidly extend their influence over larger territories. Notably, the Necrons who came from the world of Damnos have made the most efficient use of the Dolmen Gates, conducting raids across the entire Ultima Segmentum. Now for more details on the history of these portals. In the final years of the War in Heaven, one of the main factors that led to the dominance of the Necrons was their ability to finally access the webway of the Old Ones. The Catan, known as Nyadrazatha the Burning, had long wished to bring his supernatural fire into this space beyond space, and so showed the Necrons how to breach its extra-dimensional boundaries. Through a series of seemingly ordinary stone portals known as Dolmen Gates, the Necrons were finally able to turn against them the greatest weapon of the Old Ones, significantly accelerating the ultimate end of the war in heaven. The portals are not as stable and controllable as the natural entrances into the webway, scattered throughout the galaxy and currently controlled by the Eldari and their Drukhari brethren. The webway appears to detect when its integrity is breached through the Dolmen Gates, and its secret mechanisms quickly attempt to isolate the breach from the rest of the labyrinth. Necrons entering the webway must quickly reach their goal through its shifting extra-dimensional corridors to avoid the network leading them to doom while the danger to its integrity passes. Of course, a lot of time has passed since the Necrons used the Dolmen Gates to launch attacks on their enemies. The Old Ones have vanished, and the webway itself has turned into a tangled and shattered labyrinth. Many Dolmen Gates were lost or abandoned, during the great sleep of the Necrons, and even more were destroyed by the Eldari, the successors of the Old Ones, as the current guardians of the webway. The remaining gates grant access only to a small part of the vast labyrinth of the webway, much of which is voluntarily sealed off by the Eldari to prevent further contamination. Still, the webway is immeasurably vast, and even these ruptured parts allow the Necrons to travel much faster than other races. This, of course, is advantageous. As a race devoid of psychers as a result of losing their souls during the biotransference, the Necrons are also incapable of warp travel, and without access to the webway, they would be forced to rely again on slowly traveling stasis ships, dooming themselves to interstellar isolation. The inertialess drive is a form of void ship propulsion that allows it to move through space without any inertia, and to move faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. Without its mass increasing to infinite size, and without requiring an infinite amount of energy. How this is achieved without violating known laws of physics, 
remains a mystery to the Imperial Tech adepts. Inertialist drives are exclusively used by the Necrons, who are capable of interstellar travel without the need to enter the warp. As with many other Necron technologies, their inner workings remain a secret to Imperial science. The Tyranids, it seems unlikely that an alien Xenos race comprised only of biotechnology could dominate the galaxy, yet it can. Narvol is a unique Tyranid bioship that allows them to traverse interstellar space, warping space-time between the starting and ending points in space. High fleets and Tyranids do not travel through the warp like Imperial starships. Nonetheless, the incredibly fast pace of the High Fleet's progress deep into the galaxy refutes the arguments of some adepts of the Mechanicus that they do not possess a way of moving faster than light. This is partially true. Tyranids are forced to move at sublight speeds within the gravitational boundaries of star systems. However, they are capable of faster than light travel when moving through interstellar space. This ability is the result of using a small bioship of the Tyranids, classified by the scientists of the Imperium of Mankind as a Narval. Unlike most Tyranid bioships, the Narval is almost entirely defenseless. It has almost no bioweapons and very thin protective carapace. A cluster of monofilament spines on the Narval's nose allows it to perceive a wide range of sensory signals, including a broad spectrum of gravimetric and electromagnetic signals. Using these sensors, the Narval can detect new star systems at extreme interstellar distances. Then, by some unknown means, it uses the gravity of the origin star system to create a compressed space-time transit corridor through which the Narval and other Tyranid bioships can cross interstellar distances. This form of space distortion cannot be used near strong gravitational sources as they suppress the Narval's hypersensitive navigational sensors. As a result, the Tyranid Hive Fleet must use more traditional forms of biologically induced reactive thrust when approaching a new star system, which can delay their arrival by decades. This form of movement is ultimately slower than warp travel. However, it is much more reliable and allows Tyranids to relentlessly, albeit slowly, move across the galaxy. Nevertheless, the Narval's manipulations with the star system's gravity sometimes lead to unforeseen side effects. The destination world could suffer from earthquakes, solar flares, tidal waves and other natural disasters caused over time as the Hive fleet is in transit through the space-time corridor. However, this chaos only further facilitates the Tyranid invasion as the defenders of an entire world will be spending their resources to address these problems. By the time the swarm finally arrives in orbit and the first spores begin to fall, the primary role of the Navigator Guilds was to manage interstellar ships operating on the principle of folding space through a complex system of gravitational fields lying between the starting and end point of the route, calculating a safe course for their ships. Warp drive or warp engines are devices embedded in spacecraft, used by many intelligent races for actual entry into the warp an alternative dimension of pure psychic energy that resonates and underlies the familiar four dimensions of real space. The warp drive makes the ship capable of a form of faster-than-light travel known as a warp jump. The warp drive allows the spacecraft to enter the warp and move along its current until it returns to real space at a distance of tens, hundreds or even thousands of Earth light years from the starting point. This only takes a relatively short period for the spacecraft compared to moving through this distance in real space. These engines are huge and cumbersome devices that can transport only large ships. Spacecraft equipped with warp drives are known as warp-capable starships. Warp drives allow starships to enter the warp and traverse light years of real space in a relatively short time, though in an extremely hostile and dangerous environment. The engine itself was invented by humanity somewhere in the 18th millennium of the Imperial calendar during the early Dark Age of Technology. Before this time, the interstellar travel of human spaceships was limited to sublight speeds. Travel between star systems was agonizingly slow, taking many generations of voyagers, and most human interstellar colonies were isolated outposts established by the crews of starships or vessels that used pre-light speed technology. The warp drive was one of the most revolutionary inventions in human history. What once took the lives of many generations of people now took Earthlings just a few days or weeks. 
Consequently, the colonization of the Milky Way galaxy by humanity was significantly accelerated. Around the 22nd millennium, further technological progress led to the creation or discovery of warp piloting mutants known as navigators. These mutants allowed warp-capable spaceships to make longer, safer and more accurate jumps through the warp and thus further accelerated the colonization of the galaxy by humanity. Until the warp storms of the Age of Strife in the 25th millennium interrupted further warp travel and isolated all human-populated worlds from each other for almost 5,000 Earth years. How does warp navigation work? Before a starship can enter the warp, it must first travel at sublight speed to what is called the Mandeville point of the star system. This point is a certain area of space where warp travel can be initiated with the least risk and energy expenditure. This area is conventionally named as it can be anywhere on the surface of a conditional sphere around the center of attraction. Transitioning into the warp is an extremely energy-intensive process. Many ships may simply not have enough reactor power to create a warp rift near a massive celestial body. The closer the ship is to the center of mass, the more energy is needed. Of course, the captain may order to extract everything possible from the reactors, but this is very dangerous. Therefore, it is much easier and more beneficial to reach the Mandeville point and start the transition there. There is another problem. Gravity affects the course of the ship in the immaterium. Jumping from the edge of a system is significantly more precise than transitioning from a planet's low orbit. And thus, jumps not at a Mandeville point are exceedingly rare and only undertaken in emergency situations. In the solar system, for example, the Mandeville point is located slightly beyond the orbit of Eris. And in the Armageddon system, it's past the furthest observation post, Dante. Once a spacecraft activates its warp drive, it submerges into a dimension vastly different from our material universe. Warp space can conveniently be thought of as composed of relatively dense, almost liquid energy, devoid of stars, light and life as we commonly know them. Upon entering warp space, a spacecraft can move using its main jet engines, following the powerful whirls and currents within the warp eventually reaching a point in the Empyrean corresponding to its destination in real space. The most challenging aspect of warp travel is that it's impossible to detect movement within warp space when the ship is in the warp. The ship can only move forward blindly. Its crew believes they are moving in the correct direction. The longer the ship remains in such space, the greater the chances of encountering some unexpected current that could throw it off course. Navigation in warp space can be achieved in two ways, calculated jump and piloted jump. All warp drives include sophisticated navigation mechanisms. When the ship is in real space, these algorithms track the constantly changing movements of that part of the warp corresponding to the ship's current position. Essentially, this is a window into warp space. By observing these movements in the warp, one can calculate the course, correction maneuvers, and approximate travel time to the intended destination in real space. The calculation is based on the assumption that the warp currents observed from real space do not significantly change during the flight. This method is known as a calculated jump, but is often referred to as a blind jump by the personnel of the Imperial Navy. It's unsafe to make a calculated jump for more than four light years at a time. The longer the leap, the greater the chances of a significant change in the speed of the warp current. The second and more efficient form of warp navigation is the piloted jump. This method is based on two factors. A pilot who can look into the warp and steer the ship around detected dangers and a stable reference point for triangulating its position. The Imperium uses mutants known as navigators as warp pilots and the psychic beacon of the Astronomicon as a landmark. The Astronomicon is a psychic beacon that penetrates warp space to a distance of approximately 90,000 light-years from its origin point in the Imperial Palace on Terra. A navigator on board a ship in the warp is capable of capturing these psychic signals and can lead a spaceship through warp space, compensating for the current changes. A piloted jump can cover much more distance than an estimated jump. 
Most piloted warp jumps do not exceed 5,000 light years at a time, but there have been instances of longer distances. Traitor and Chaos ships often lack navigators, as most navigators prefer suicide to betraying the Imperium. However, they compensate for this by using a possessed Chaos space marine or another demon as the pilot, as such a mingling of humans and demons is capable, like any mortal navigator, of safely guiding the ship through the flows of the Empire. As soon as the Mandeville point is crossed, the warp engines of the ship can be activated safely. The crew, careless or reckless enough to prematurely activate their engine, would be lucky only to discover that their ship has deviated from its course by thousands of light years. With the safe activation of its warp engine, the ship breaks out of the real universe and enters warp space. All Imperial warp ships are equipped with a special module attached to the engine, which emits a unique protective force field called the Geller field. It creates around the starship a bubble of real space, which it essentially carries into warp with it. The field protects the starship and its inhabitants from the hostile nature of the warp, as well as from predatory warp entities such as demons, as a demon cannot enter the field. The Geller field is a reality field, the source of which emanates from the dreams of a psyker, who is in a comatose slumbering state inside a complex mechanism. While in coma, they psychically project around the ship an aura of normality, in which the physical laws of real space still apply. The ship effectively protects itself in the reality projections of sleeping psychers, serving as a bubble of real space, temporarily repelling the immaterium. However, these psychers usually lose their lives through this process after a relatively short time, meaning any warp-capable spaceship must have new psycho batteries to replace the old almost instantly, weakening failure or collapse of the field during a starship's travel through the warp can lead to catastrophic consequences. Warp entities will tear the ship apart to reach and consume the souls of its crew and passengers. An unprotected human in the warp might be possessed by demonic entities or driven insane by the hostile environment itself. People disappear without a trace, while deranged mobs riot on the decks, living out their nightmares, leading to mass murders and suicides. Sometimes the ship emerges from the warp, physically undamaged, but without a single trace of its crew. Numerous ghost ships drift across the galaxy, and all who encounter them while navigating the Black Sea of the Void consider them an ill omen. As for the Orcs, the question arises of how to enforce any safety regulations upon a race that inherently scoffs at any rules. They do not require them. Many of these warp engines are salvaged from the ruins of rescued Imperial warp drives, while others are whimsical, ingenious constructs built with the aid of imagination and duct tape. Like all Orc technologies, however odd they may be, the wah energy, it seems, ultimately feeds off the psychic forces of the Greenskins, allowing them to defy the known laws of physics of real space with their creations. Orcs rarely worry about navigation, activating the warp exit system spontaneously in hopes of finding a suitable world for battle. Instead of the flickering Geller fields of Imperial starships, Orcs utilize an array of decorations, totems, huge plates, bodies painted with symbols, and protective glyphs to fend off the harmful influence of the warp. It's uncertain whether they actually repel warp entities as claimed by orc freebooter pirates or simply instill confidence in their crews. Confidence that transforms into a surrounding, crackling shield of wah energy. Perhaps demons simply do not relish the taste of orc souls as much as those of humans. Such protection seems to work most of the time, but occasionally demons manage to infiltrate orc ships providing entertainment for the bored crew. Tau Technology. Their accelerator engine, ZFR Horizon, also unofficially known as the ZFR Drive, represents a starship interstellar travel system, which was the greatest invention of the Tau Earth cast and allowed the Tau Empire to rapidly develop during the second sphere of expansion. This powerful new mechanism enabled Tau starships to reach near light speed, it is the primary means of interstellar travel for Tau and is used by all ships of the Koravatra fleet. The rise of this race can be regarded as developing over five different phases, periods of intense growth known to Tau as the spheres of expansion. Each of these waves of colonization is characterized by a long accumulation of resources, 
followed by continuous waves of exploratory missions, accompanied where necessary by military campaigns to secure territorial conquests. As soon as a Tao colony transforms into a stable settlement, it becomes the launching point for the next expansion. By the end of the millennia-long expansion of the First Sphere, as it was later called, the Tao Empire consisted of eight fully settled star systems, known as Sept. Named after its primary world, a Sept may include any number of additionally colonized planets or moons, as well as other objects such as outposts, sensor fields, shield satellites, orbital cities, and mining enterprises. All are connected together, both by a series of space stations and a massive network of communications and sensor relays installed between the main points. Each sept is unique with its own cultural nuances and varying proportions of Tau castes and alien populations. The end of the first expansion of the Tau race is a combination of several factors. Firstly, despite the terrifying demographic explosion that their race experienced, their numbers were too small and there was a felt need for more representatives of each caste. Warriors of the fire caste were in particularly high demand. Warriors who were led to conquer new planets turned out to be expensive, and ongoing conflicts were still raging in remote areas. The second reason why the expansion of the first sphere came to a halt was simply the distances between systems. After colonizing many dense star clusters near their homeworld on the eastern edge of the galaxy, the spaces between worlds became much larger. At that time, it was already impossible to cross the entire empire in one lifetime using slow sublight engines. The crossing of the black abysses surrounding their star systems by the available spaceships would take many, many generations. The Tau clearly needed new methods of interstellar space travel. The first problem was resolved by integrating the Krut race into the Tau Empire after the so-called War of Unification. In this conflict, the Tau and Krut initially united to repel massive orc assaults on the Krut world, followed by the liberation of other Krut enclaves under the pressure of the Greenskins. In a short period of time, the armies of the Firecast were bolstered by billions of additional Krut warriors. Only the Earthcast failed to achieve the set goal of developing a new method of faster interstellar travel. With engineering hubs working diligently in each sept, the Earth cast provided countless innovations for the Tau army and society, but the invention required by the Ethereals eluded them. The breakthrough occurred in the Sept of Falchia, where scientists and engineers of the Earth cast completed the development of the ZFR Horizon Accelerator engine. This powerful new mechanism allowed Tau starships to reach near light speed. It was this device that began the next phase of progress as now Tau ships could reach new star systems in just a few Earth years, while their crews experienced very little subjective passage of time due to the relativistic effects of motion at such high speeds. But the constant acceleration of expansion rates necessitates even faster methods of moving resources and troops. The Damocles Gulf was ablaze, and for the Tau it became clear that crossing it required too much time. The ethereal caste decided to choose a more dangerous, but potentially revolutionary path that could solve their problems. Since the first brutal encounter with humanity, the Earth caste's scientific divisions had been sent to study the primitive technology of the Imperium, including the means by which humans made jumps through vast spaces of space. After decades of research and testing, during which Imperial technologies were combined with the remnants of Krut war spheres secretly obtained from earlier expansion battlefields, a breakthrough was achieved. The AL-38 module became the prototype of a device that could be installed on the engine of any ship. This module could create an antimatter bubble around the ship, which moved at such a speed that it could pierce the very fabric of reality allowing it to bypass vast spaces and significantly reduce travel time. The first tests of the module were extremely successful. Tau ships, equipped with this prototype, were able to cross the entire Imperium in a few days, whereas previously such a journey took months. The raging starfire in the Damocles Gulf could theoretically be bypassed. The Ethereals initiated the fourth sphere of expansion. 
Until then, the engine had only been used in tests to move a single ship with the prototype on board over short distances. Earthcast scientist Carbuto, who was behind the development of the engine, warned that the mass opening of wormholes in reality was not sufficiently calculated at the moment, and that using this engine for a fleet of ships to jump could be dangerous. But the successful tests of a single crossing satisfied numerous tests, and they allowed for the creation of the fourth expansion fleet. The achievements in the Damocles Gulf required swift development. The new fleet was assembled in the north of the Imperium at the Numenar Point. Hundreds of the fleet's ships launched their AL-38 prototypes. The combined activation of hundreds of antimatter fields simultaneously acted like an interspatial pulse bomb, tearing the veil between realities. A jagged rift in real space opened before the Fourth Sphere fleet. The rift spewed unnatural colours and rolling semiforms. The horrified Tau helplessly watched as the breach, expanding with each moment, hurtled towards their grim fate. Commanders fired up the Horizon engines, trying to escape the whirlwind, but the storm of unreality inexorably sucked in the ships. Ultimately, the storm swallowed the entire fleet whole, leaving nothing behind but a whirlwind of nauseous, unreal colours. Images of what happened were broadcasted across the world of the Septs. The jump was a success, despite the horrific scene that unfolded. Numerous reconnaissance drones scattered into the depths of space, seeking the signal of the fourth wave fleet. But years went by, and no traces were found. The prototype program was frozen, as were dreams of rapid travel across the galaxy. However, hope arrived with a solitary drone that returned to the Tau Empire and brought a captured signal from the Fourth Fleet. The signal came from the Zone of Silence, a sector that remained after the raid of the Tyranid Hive Fleet Gorgon. The Ethereals issued a new directive which firmly required many scientists to leave their native septs and engage in studying the newly unfrozen AL-38 engine program. Around the first vortex where the fleet disappeared, polygonal gates the size of the moon the Star Tide Nexus were built. They serve as a defense base around which the Tau fleet tirelessly stands guard and as a base for research and tests. Soon, the fleet was found and they spoke of how, after the journey in the warp, two-thirds of the ships were lost due to attacks when entering the Immaterium, and the entire Auxilia and members of other races were eradicated by the Tau as a source of the warp spawn. Their rescue and the appearance of a second wormhole were described by the survivors as an intervention by a strange mighty force, which extracted them from the warp and opened a second vortex. The Tau were able to transfer a new fleet through the star tide nexus and stably use the vortex for deploying their forces. The Elder cannot travel through the warp as there is a great danger of becoming victims of that which thirsts Slanesh. For movement, they use a safer method. The webway, also known as the Labyrinth Dimension or Labyrinthine Dimension, is an extra-dimensional space, separated from the Immaterium millions of Earth years ago by an extremely advanced Xenos species known as the Old Ones. Today it is used by the Elder of Craft Worlds and their kin, the Drukhari, for faster-than-light travel. It serves as home to the vast dark city of Komara and the hidden craft world controlled by the Harlequins, known as the Black Library. The webway stands out as a hyperdimensional construct that exists between the material world and the churning waves of the warp. This separator is comparable to a to a cloth veil thrown over real space. Like all of the most prized artifacts of the Elder, the webway was created by psychic means and its countless corridors are protected from invasion from the warp. Let's find out how it was created. The webway was created by the Old Ones, technologically advanced, intelligent beings who established an interstellar empire across the Milky Way galaxy, tens of millions of standard years before the development of most other intelligent species. They created the webway as a channel that allowed them to travel at will to countless and distant worlds, without risking entering the unstable waves of the warp. The Eldar were trained in this arcane technology by the Old Ones, and quickly mastered the labyrinthine dimension of the web, expanding their realms from the farthest corners of reality, where they learned many of the secrets of the universe, now forgotten or hidden. They mastered the original network of the webway, though it has significantly changed since the heyday of the Elder Empire, torn apart by war and disaster.
small Eldar ships, moored in the docks on the outskirts of the craft world, travel between the various craft worlds using the webway. The main gates to the webway take the form of rotating spheres of light and darkness, held in stasis at the vast stern of each craft world. The webway paths lead to the craft worlds, to the surface of the green Exodite worlds, to the corrupted city of the Drukhari Komora, and to countless thousands of other worlds across the galaxy. Although the webway still connects many Eldar worlds and craft worlds to each other, sinister energy and time have destroyed its hyperspace pathways in countless places. Among the ruined and treacherous tentacles of the webway, there are many nooks, dead ends and labyrinths that can trap the unwary traveller. Some lead to places long abandoned or destroyed, or now inhabited by the demons of the warp. In the farthest corners of the webway are located mighty port cities of the Drukhari and nests teeming with particularly like warp entities known as Cycnuin. But best hidden of all the webway's secrets is a hidden craft world called the Black Library. The precise outline and shape of the webway are not entirely understood by the current Eldar, let alone the xenographers of the Imperium. Rumours say that thousands of Terran years ago, an interspatial map was created, a priceless artefact that is now kept in the Black Library. Holding secrets unfathomable to mortals, it shows many hidden paths that have since been lost or forgotten. If so, then the keepers of this strange domain have decided to keep their secrets. While some webway tunnels are large enough to transport spaceships, most tunnels only allow passage to the lighter Eldar forces, on foot or on small transports. Travel through the network is relatively fast, allowing space fleets to move easily between the main webway gates. This allows the Eldar to quickly reach places directly connected to the labyrinth dimension, but makes it extremely difficult for them to reach worlds without gates to the webway. Space is not the most hospitable place in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. War tearing the galaxy apart rages not only on the surfaces of planets, but also in the void of space. Battles encompassing entire star systems require rapid movements and swift reactions to changes in theatres of war. Under such conditions, the ability to move quickly and safely across hundreds of light years becomes a guarantee of victory in a long war. The technological race continues and with each day the stakes get higher. The Imperium of Man must protect and maintain the borders of its vast empire. The Tao strive for a new sphere of expansion, the Tyranids crave to devour new worlds, and the Eldar need to preserve the remnants of their once great civilization. And all these problems come down to just one barrier, speed.